Welcome to the fan of history. We are getting so close, so close. Um, so close to the Neo Assyrian Empire. But first, we're going to talk about what happened in the 930s BC. I'm just a fan of history. I'm not a scientist. I want to learn. So if I say something that's wrong, feel free to correct me. Chronology is an issue. The sources are weak and vague. There are different ways of counting the years and some years are bound to be wrong but i made some decisions about the years and i will stick with them please watch the earlier videos and the summarized video of the great civilizations of the world in 1000 bc first we're going to talk about the arameans and the neo-hittites these guys neo-hittites hanging around in southeastern turkey and syria and the arameans hanging around everywhere that's not locked so, as I mentioned in last episode, they are merging. The Arameans are looking at the new Hittites for and see these palaces of the art and the wealth that remains of the Hittite Empire that is long gone at this time. And they begin merging, they share the imagery. This is uh, the storm god of the Hittites, and uh, he is also worshipped by the Arameans. Kardemish is the most important city. And in three slides, I will show you the location of Karkemish. Karkemish is the name of the city. And it will be important in the next century. But as I said before, the Armenians are starting to settle down. They have been this barbarian menace to everybody in the Middle East for a couple of hundred years. But they are not anymore. And in 935 BC, Tiglath Peleser II, the king of Assyria, dies. He is succeeded by his son, Ashurdan II, and Ashurdan does a lot of things. So many things, actually, that some people say that the doomsday clock strikes now, that this is the beginning of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. But I am not going to go with that. I think 911 BC is the beginning of the Empire, and I will tell you why in two episodes. Uh, however, Ashurdan II does a lot of things, and we'll talk more about that next time. But it turns the tide on the Arameans, so the Arameans are not that interested in fighting the Assyrians anymore. So uh, the Assyrians can start to build, as I mentioned before, strong warriors, they have iron weapons, they have more iron than anyone else at this point, and they... Ashurdan will soon, not yet, revive the tradition of annual military campaigns. And also the Assyrians start keeping records again. They have been silent. The historical record from Assur is silent since the days of Tiglath Peleser I. So for 180 years or so, there has been very, very little recorded in Assyria. There, is some, there are some records, but uh, now they start popping up again. So something is important is about to happen. And the guy to the right is not Asher Dan II, but he's Asher, the god of war. Look at him. I just adore him. He's a, a little guy with wings and a bow. And he's the most terrifying god in the Middle East. He's the Assyrian war god that forces them to go on campaign every year. And he looks like this. I will show you more pictures of him in the religion show if I do it and in further Assyria. Uh, talks. Shoshenk is the pharaoh of Egypt and Egypt is still so much stronger than Assyria. Last episode Shoshenk uh, united uh, Egypt. He rules Egypt up, up until 922 BC. He's a Libyan pharaoh. He's the first pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty. He is refocusing the military. Remember he was a general before he became pharaoh. He put down, down a small uprising in the Dakla Oasis. I don't know who was uprising or why, or why they thought they would get away with fighting with the great chief of the Ma, that, which the pharaoh still is as well. The Ma or the Meshwesh is a Libyan tribe that were soldiers in Egypt. Shoshenk is planning an attack on Canaan. He will try to reclaim the new kingdom territory that has been lost for hundreds of years to Egypt. And in order to do this, he has good relationships with his neighbors to the south, the Kushians, and he also has a good relationship with the Phoenicians, especially King Abibal of Byblos. So let's talk about the Phoenicians. We are in the golden age of Phoenicia, but I haven't mentioned them a lot because uh, their sources are extra vague. 
I believe that the Phoenicians kept the records on papyrus. And given that they live in a humid for, uh, climate, the, the papyrus is lost. Whereas the Assyrians and the Egyptians will keep the records in stone. So we have them, but we don't have the records of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians have been around forever, since the 3rd millennium BC, in these trading cities. Every city is independent, including the one on uh, Cyprus, Kidion. They are trading cities, and they have an excellent way of avoiding all the empires taking them over. We'll talk more about that later. This is also Tyre, actually, which is over here is the, the birthplace of the idea of Carthage and we'll talk more about Carthage I think in the 820s episode but Carthage is still far away and Sheshonk is not targeting the Phoenicians because the Phoenicians is everybody's buddy they are trading with the Egyptians, they're trading with the Arameans, they're trading with the Neo Hittites so Sheshonk's target is Canaan and we'll talk a lot more about Canaan and and here the Bible becomes a huge problem, which we will discuss next episode. In China, King Mu is still ruling. Woohoo! He's more ambitious than wise. We don't have any dated events. Check the events of the 950s show for more on King Mu and his adventures. He might be the greatest king that uh, the Su dynasty or China ever had. But let's look a bit at how he rules China. So the Sioux territory is number one here. This is the Sioux territory. So this is the only land that King Mu directly controls. The rest of his lands are controlled by vassals. And the, they are traditional kings of these areas. And especially the Chu in area 10 here are a problem. As we've already seen them causing problems before. Uh, Right now, King Mu is strong and he has control of this. New territory is added to the Su Empire and his allies and relatives are put in positions of leadership in the new territories. They are loyal to King Mu, everything is great. But when they die, their sons take over because it becomes hereditary in reality. I don't think it was the idea that governorship would be hereditary, but it becomes hereditary. And the ties between the royal house of Su and the provincial governors becomes less and less strong. And this will lead to enormous problems for the Su dynasty. So whereas this dynasty is, will be going for seven, eight hundred years more after this, they will never be as strong as they are right now under King Mu. So, what's going on with the Olmecs in Mexico? Well, we know that since the 950s, then San Lorenzo is losing people to La Venta. La Venta is slowly becoming the main point of the Olmec civilization in Mexico. But this time, we know something about two other civilizations in the Americas. That is the Poverty, po poverty Point culture and uh, Peru. So, we'll talk about those. The Poverty Point poverty point culture reaches its peak. This is a late archaic archaeological culture in uh, North America. It has its heartland in the lower Mississippi Valley and in the surrounding Gulf Coast. It is going on from 2200 BC to 700 BC. That's 1500 years. And we know from archaeology that they traded with other Native Americans all the way from Georgia to the Great Lakes. And they are one of the mound, mound builder cultures. And this is Poverty Point itself and the earthworks they had made there. I might come back to the Poverty Point. I would, uh, I would love to learn more about them. So if you know more about them, tell me. Here is maybe my favorite culture of all time. Uh, it's the rise of the Chavin in Peru. It's very early. It may be too early for the Chavin. But they are the second sophisticated civilization to arise in Peru. And the first one was Norte Chico. There's a, a gap that is at least 500 years between them, probably longer. So they seem to have no relationship to Norte Chico. And they actually show more relationship. They show more similarities to the Olmecs, but they have also zero contact with the Olmecs. It is physically impossible to get from Peru to Mexico uh, in these times. So they don't have any contact with the Olmecs. And another weird thing about the Chavins 
are that they have no warfare. There is no archaeological evidence of warfare. Uh, their diet consists of potatoes, quinoa, guinea pigs, birds, clams and shellfish. This is their first stage, the Urabario. We have no written records, we don't know anything except from archaeology. Uh, the best site is Chavin de Huantar over here. And I will talk more about the Chavins later, but first then, note them that they have no warfare. So the Chavin influence areas here, they're just people that want to be like the Chavins. But the Chavins are not conquering anybody because, let's face it, they are hippies on drugs. They, their culture is strongly ruled by shamans and it is focused around the shape-shifting of these shamans into leopards. It's all about shape-shifting and consuming some sort of cacti. So you, the shamans are depicted with like stuff running out of their nose because they prop themselves full with this cacti to, to become high. So you have a, a non-warfare society ruled by drug addicts and it's amazing, I love them. Uh, we'll go, come back to the Chavins and see what we can learn about them. If you know more about the Chavins and know about great resources for me to read about them, please let me know. But they are now, they are now one of the great cultures of the world and we'll be mentioning them every episode which I can say about the PowerPoint culture. Because they are not just on this level of civilization. So uh, nothing is going on in Europe as usual. Nothing that we know about. I'm sure there are plenty of chieftains doing stuff but not anything that has come down to us through the ages. Same thing about India. We know that Kuru is strong. Panchala is probably around. It's the early Vedic period but we don't have any good sources. Uh, time to mention also that archaeology is really, really hard in India and archaeology hasn't come very far. It, there is a lot of work to be done about this period and I hope it is done and I can revisit this in like 10-15 years because things are happening right now. So let's talk about Bronze Age money. You hear all about these traders. The Phoenicians are traders, the Assyrians are traders. They love trading a lot actually. And at the time they were really small, the Assyrians, they still traded. So trade has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. Probably trading is as old as traveling. So, but we don't have coins. There's still a, hundred, a couple of hundred years to go before coins are invented. So how did people actually exchange stuff with each other? Of course there was barter, but there was also standardized ingots of metal. We're looking here at the oxide ingot from Cyprus. Uh, the idea is that ingot, the ingots of metal, I think this is tin, uh, must look the same and weigh the same of course and there was all opportunity in the world to cheat the system. But if you had standardized ingots of a certain size you could trade them sort of this costs two ingots and money was heavy and you had to carry it around and it was hard to trade with money. There were also knife money in the Middle East. There were ceremonial knives made of precious metal that you could give away. So like this thing is one oxide ingot and five knives. So they really need coins but they won't invent coins for a long time. In China they used to trade using shells, yes seashells, but now they have bronze shells. So they made replicas of the trading shells by uh, bronze. They also trade using knives, very like the knife money from the Middle East, spades and hoes. So trading, not that easy. Thank you PayPal for making it easier. So the next episode will be the events of the 920s BC. Sheshonk will fight his way into the Bible. The Pharaoh, this is why we know so much about Sheshonk, because he will write about it and he's much well known than other pharaohs of his dynasty. And he will appear in the Bible. King Mu celebrates his 105th birthday. We take a look at Africa south of the Sahara. I will release the show on May the 5th. And remember, the war begins on May the 12th. The new Assyrian Empire will rise. You can discuss the show with me on YouTube or on Facebook. 
And please, please subscribe, like and share because it helps me to keep going. I hope you appreciate my accent. I am from Sweden. That's why I speak English like a drunk Viking. Uh, and I'm trying to improve my English, but uh, it is not perfect. Thank you for watching.